Hi, everybody. I think we're live. Um, a warm hello. Welcome to all of you. I wish I could see you. Uh, my name is Dorothea von Moltke. I'm one of the owners of Labyrinth Books. And um, I've been looking forward to tonight's conversation with Darcy Stanky and uh, Susan Wheeler ever since we had initially planned it for when Darcy's amazing new book, uh, Flash Count Diary, Menopause and the Vindication of Natural Life, uh, first came out in the spring of 2019. And that event fell through, so I'm extra glad that um, we can now make up for that um, now that the paperback is out uh, of that book. And here it is. I always like to make sure we look at the book itself. Um, beautiful book. And so Darcy and Susan are waiting in the wings. I'm going to bring them up soon. But I have uh, some people to thank first. Both Princeton University's um, Program in Gender and Sexuality Studies and the Princeton Lewis Center for the Arts are co-sponsoring the event tonight um, and have helped us to get word out. And those are partnerships that really mean a great, great deal to us at Labyrinth. Um, thank you. A few practical things too. On the bottom of the screen, uh, there's a link that you can see to our website where you can get Darcy's book for 10% off, you have to use the promo code STANKY. And truly all of you and all your friends and relations, men and women both should read this book um, since menopause is such an outrageously under discussed topic. And uh, Darcy's book makes that, uh, Mark makes that void uh, in our conversation visible in the same um, instant as it fills it in really surprising and always lyrical ways. So um, I urge you to order Flash Count Diary from us online. You can also just stop by the store and pick it up um, or uh, get it curbside if you want to give us a call. Um, and all that information is also in the chat at the top of the chat, um, as well as on labyrinthbooks.com. Um, I'm actually going to take the chat down during the conversation and then I will uh, put it back up during the Q&A. So uh, our plan for this hour that we have together is this. I'm going to take just a couple minutes to introduce our guests, then Darcy and Susan will talk, and we will leave plenty of time for your questions after that. Since the chat won't be up, um, here's how to ask a question on this particular platform. It's a little different from Zoom. Uh, there's an Ask a Question button at the bottom in the middle of your screen. And you can just go there and um, put your questions in the queue as you think of them, and um, we'll get to them. A very quick tech tip, which I hope won't be necessary, but um, this platform works best on Chrome or Firefox as your browser. So should you have any trouble with video or audio, one thing to try is just to copy and paste the URL and open up a Chrome or Firefox browser. Um, and uh, hopefully that'll resolve it and probably, and hopefully it just won't be necessary, but um, just in case. So now just a little more background. Um, you may know Darcy Stanky from her acclaimed novels. The, um, the, the two most recent ones are, are Milk and Sister Golden Hair, uh, or maybe from her memoir, Easter Everywhere. Others among you might have um, met her when uh, during her time teaching um, creative writing at Princeton. She has also taught at several other universities and colleges, was writer in residence at Barnard, and is uh, currently teaching at the New School. Susan Wheeler also teaches creative writing at the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton, but um, the two were friends before they were colleagues, actually. Uh, Susan is an extraordinary poet um, whose poetry collections include um, a ledger, assorted poems, and the most recent one is Meme, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, while Darcy writes uh, in Flash Count Diary at some point that faith is not natural to her, there, there is a persistent tangling with uh, the spiritual in all of her work, I think. And in this new book, um, the search for, for both the physical and the metaphysical dimensions of 
post-reproductive life, for how this uh, phase changes the body and the spirit, very beautifully brings her close to the creaturely world, um, including the creaturely in us humans. In addition, uh, the book is it combines memoir, um, medical history, it's a philosophical probe, a feminist manifesto. We can learn, I think, both individually and collectively from it. And this is um, this really mattered to me uh, how to how to revalue what challenges us about menopause. Um, so I am immensely grateful for this beautiful book. Yeah. And with that, I am now going to um, hand things over to my good friend, Susan, and her good friend, Darcy. Let me just find them. Let's see. Hi. There's Darcy. Hi, Hi Darcy. And Susan. Yes. Hi, Hi. welcome Hi. both of you. I'm gonna uh, duck out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dorothea. Yeah, thank you, Dorothea, yeah. Darcy. I know. Talk about this book. I know. I'm so excited. I, I love that the paperback is out now and I had the chance to reread it. And um, I was so, before we get into the subject, which is um, uh, it's just revolutionary, your mm -hmm. approach to it in so many ways, I just wanted to commend the writing, um, mm. which I is, you know, just beautiful throughout the book. Um, the book combines Combines, combines personal experience, again, um, history, uh, a lot of interviewing, a lot of sort of, you know, casual social science, mm -hmm. um, as well as, uh, as well as theory throughout. Mm. Um, and so the mix is a difficult one to put mm. on a page, mm. but I just wanted to read people a, a, two sentences um, that give an example of how, how spare and yet evocative, how condensed and yet evocative your writing is. And this is, um, a, 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 these sentences occur when she's describing a drive um, to Dover Plains, New York. Winter is sliding into spring. The trees are in first bud. Once I turn onto Route 22, tulips bob in yards and tiny white petals like confetti float down over the road. Just beautiful. <laughs> Thank just, you so just, much. Just that means thought. so much coming from you, the master Winter poet. Sliding. Wow. Thank Winter you so is much. Winter sliding into spring is just... <laughs> Wonderful. Anyway, mm. to the subject. Okay. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, there's so much about animals here. Mm -hmm. um, and you looked, uh, you, you really spend in depth time mm -hmm. on a couple of mammals, gorillas, mm. whales. Right. Um, but you also bring in elephants. Right. And yes. A, uh, an aphid, salmon. Mm. Aphid. Um, so I... I wonder, since this is sort of how I first heard about the book forming, was around this idea of whales, hmm. the whale. Um, I wondered if you would talk a little bit about how how you thought about animals and how all of that erupted. Okay, okay. I Well, the whole thing started really with, I just have to do a little bit about menopause, and then I can go back to the animals, because the whole thing really started with me struggling with my own menopause and not being able to find like even one positive thing about it. Like, I, you know, I'm a writer, so I look for books. I could find so no books really. And then in the New York Times, I saw this little article that um, human women and female killer whales, no, yeah, human women and female killer whales are the two creatures that go through menopause. And we now know that um, short fin pilot whales and narwhals also go through menopause. And those are the only creatures that do. So that led me at first to the whale. So she was my first, you know, the whales were my first animal. And really from that, I got obsessed with this whale, Lolita, who's in captivity in Miami. I flew down really having no plan at all. I just flew down to like protest with people, you know, for her release in the parking lot. 
and I started to just get obsessed with whales. I would listen to the whale. I, you know, I got the hydrophone live link on my computer and I would listen to it. I didn't hear it very much, sadly, but probably, you know, probably out of the three years I worked on the book, I probably heard the whales like maybe 10 times. But when I did, it was big. And to hear them like in my Brooklyn, you know, my Brooklyn office, which is so amazing. Um, I read whale, whale blogs. And of course, I eventually went to see the whales, you know, and the whales that were in this particular study are the southern residents who live in the Salish Sea, um, in the San Juan, in the San Juan Islands, um, just out from Seattle and Washington State. Um, and so I kind of used her like a totem. I realize now, like I didn't really realize when it was happening to me what was actually happening to me, you know, because it had never happened to me before. I mean, I've always been, I've had religious practices, and I've, I've gone to church, and I've, I've meditated, and I've prayed, and I've you know, I've read Thomas Merton and I've read, you know, Simone Veil, but I never really had it happen to like grab me from the animal world like that. Like that was new, you know? So it was amazing. I mean, and I didn't really understand what was happening the whole time until like near the end where I'm like, oh, this, this was actually, this was a, this was a whole spiritual thing, you know, where this animal sort of led me through my own life process, you know, and I'm the last person you would ever think, you know, I don't like to camp, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not that crazy about animals. Like, I, you know, I love nature, but like, you would never think this would happen. So it was really out of the blue and really amazing. And then really what happened is I got to see J2, you know, granny, the hundred, you know, five-year-old whale of the, um, you know, of the uh, Southern residents. And then in some ways she sort of became like a, a gateway, to, you know, you know, to other animals. So in the book, I decided that I would try to, I would try to figure out like what it was like to be like an aging mammal, you know, like of the mammals that like, like, you know, so I did elephants, I did gorillas. And I really like not the cute little baby ones, but what happens when they, you know, when they're, the, you know, near the end of their life cycle, you know? And that was interesting. And I hadn't really read about that that much either. You know, most people don't really want to talk about the, you know, the end of, you know, you know, the last, you know, 10 years or so of, you know, animals' lives. Um, so I went to see, I went to see Ambika at the National Zoo. You know, she's this elephant who's, I think she's 64 now, and she was amazing. Um, and then Colo in, I think it was in the, like the Annapolis um, Zoo, uh, the Annapolis Zoo. I, yeah, she's passed now. But um, so just to learn more about what their lives were like. And I learned a lot. I felt a lot of compassion for them more than I thought. Like I remember when I was studying like gorillas, I still think about this all the time. You know, gorillas have it pretty tough, like gor gorilla females, because you know, there's one silverback and then there's between two to 10 women. And they're the silverbacks are, you know, they're kind of rough, you know. And sometimes another silverback will come and break into the group and, you know, and threaten the you threaten the leader and and sometimes some of the women or the female gorillas will actually go with that uh like gorilla if they think that that gorilla is more powerful actually and leave their family group and sometimes they'll even leave children there mm -hmm. and and there's this picture i found in one of these books of this you know woman girl this female girl who's decided to do this and she's looking sort of back and it is just like, you see it all in her face, you know? I mean, it's just really moving. I have to say, I think about that once a week even, you know, now still, you know, like I just learned so much about the emotion. I mean, who knows what their emotions are, but I felt I felt empathy for them so much in their um, struggles. Um, and it's, it's definitely going, it's happening more now. Like now I got obsessed with eels this summer and I, you know, when the eels run in September back down, cause they all breed in this, like in the sales and no, the, they all breed in the Sargasso Sea. So I was saying to my cousin, actually I told her that they breed in the wide Sargasso Sea, but, but that's only if you're, if you were a lit major, but, um, but uh, I didn't get to go see it because the water was too high. It was raining too much, but I had my strong flashlight because I really wanted to see them go back to Delaware, actually back into the sea to breed. So it's, it's, and it's gotten like, you know, I'm, I got a spider bite because I'm leaving all the spider webs up now, you know, so it's getting, it's definitely getting, more. I don't, I don't know exactly where it's going to lead, but I find it like, particularly because I'm not like inside churches a lot now, I find it that the animals are almost becoming like, they seem to have a, a very, I don't even want to say holy, but because that seems to like, you know, put them over here, but they seem, they have a lot of meaning for me, like a great, great meaning for me at the moment. Mm -hmm. I loved how 
how you described a lot of books out there on menopause and also mm -hmm. went back through the history, mm -hmm. um, including some implanting of animal parts in human beings. Yeah, right. Um, there was just all of this, all of this. Amazing. And that was based on yeah, crazy, I know. Um, but uh, uh, your book seems to write the balance in a way, because in each of the books that you describe and in all of the studies to date, mm -hmm. um, the description is that there's something wrong with the woman. Mm. There's, it's the it's the woman's body that's the problem mm -hmm. in relationships post menopause, in right? Whatever, exactly, and, yeah. And that's where the vindication of natural life comes in, right? And so, even though it's not sort of a how to book on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how how to deal with hot flashes and how to you know all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It still seems like a how-to book in terms of how to honor and approach the post-reproductive life mm. um, and, and look at aspects of it that are really boons. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, the gains, the gains. Actually, nobody wants to talk about the gains, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, I think that I mean, it's hard. I mean, you really have to reframe. I had to reframe it in order to even be able to think about it because it's so, I mean, when you just, if you're just left alone to Google it out, you know, like, you know, the websites about menopause, I mean, even the way they listed the script, you know, the sim like symptoms, I mean, even the fact that there are symptoms is wrong actually, because it's a natural part of life, but it'll be like, you know, it'll be like a senile ovaries. Now, okay, there's, there's a better way to say that. You know what I mean? Like, it, but each of the ones will be like, like a nasty zookeeper, you know, saying something about their, you know, decrepit animal. I mean, it's really terrible, you know, so, and it's, and that's, there's no doubt that's had a strong effect on us, you know? So um, that was the thing that I really worked hard. I, I mean, I, I knew myself as I was going through it, I could tell right away that it was going to be new and therefore sort of interesting, like new things are, you know? Um, and there were going to be changes, but I wasn't convinced that they were all negative. You know, I wasn't convinced it was a disease that had to be cured. You know, I mean, I think some parts of it are hard and, and there are some, you know, of course, like treatments are there, but it's not like the whole thing is this, is this disease part of life and that women, I mean, I have a lot of friends that, you know, when I hear about their struggles with their partners sometimes in this part of life, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you, there's something wrong with you, you know, you need to go to your gynecologist and straighten this out. You know what I mean? And that's just not really true. I mean, there's ways in which our bodies feel now that are different than when we were 25 and hell yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And like, you know, let's that, like, let's get that to lead our, you know, desires. Like, right. Like, um, actually whether it's physically or whether it's whatever, whether it's in your like professional life, your family life. I mean, one of the hardest parts about going around when the a book first came out was the women. I mean, it was also, I felt very grateful for it, but the women, it was hard to hear though. The women that would come up to me and tell me that um, people would make fun of them at work. You know, people would, uh, you know, they make endless jokes about sweating and the air conditioner, but their husbands would make fun of them. And sometimes their kids would make fun of them too. Like, you know, and, and it really upset me. Like, and, and they were sort of saying, how can I talk to them about it? And I realized like, like, she, like that woman needs to stick up for herself, but the culture itself needs to be rejigged. So this is not a problem. You know what I mean? Like they're, 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 it's the wrong mindset, you know? It's like, so that, that, and, and there's some, like I know in like England, they're starting to, well, they, they're having some corporations and, and businesses are gonna have cold rooms and they get tax breaks to have cold rooms so women can go in. They're, actually, they're a little bit ahead of us in England. And then, um, look, also, the Department of um, the Minister of Education just said that they're going to teach it. And this is sort of like, like when you hear this, you know, they're acting like it's a big thing, but it's crazy that they haven't. They're finally going to teach it in sex ed along with puberty and birth. It's just like, I mean, it's insane that they weren't. You know what I, mean? I mean, no wonder that we have no information and everybody's all freaked out about it, you know, like, because 
when that vacuum of, of lack of information happens, you know, that's when a lot of shame comes in, you know, both for, you know, for the women and, and, and probably for the families as well. Like they don't understand it that, you know, there's nothing like they don't know anything about it. Uh, they, and so, you know, this you're kind of you're jokey, uncomfortable, and then shame comes in as well. So, I mean, I found a lot of things that are positive. I mean, a lot. Like, you know, I'd say, yeah, I'm steadier, I would say. Mm, let's see what else. I'd say I have a lot of energy. I mean, it's it's not that fun to cycle. Hello. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I mean, cycling is hard, you know? It's important, of course. We, we wouldn't be sitting here without cycling, but like, it's not like that's the greatest phase in the world, you know, for a woman, you know, and so enjoyable, like, right? So I just feel I like love, it, what? Yeah, I'm sorry. I love that whole passage in the book and and Abby's reaction, your daughter's reaction. Yeah. To the second time she got her period, it's <laughs> yeah. like, what? I got it again. <laughs> she what? couldn't believe it. She <laughs> thought she only got, because I did the whole talk and I prepared her for years, you know? And then when she got it, there was like a feeling of kind of pride and like, but then the next month she broke into my office and it was like, I got it again. And I'm like, you're going to get it every <laughs> month. And the, the expression on her face was such horror, you know, just like, and, and complete be bewilderment. And I had to say, and then she sort of goes, why? If I'm only going to have, I might not have any kids or two. And I'm just like, it's just the way it works. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, like, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I also really liked your discussion about one of the gains is being a kind of ungendering. Mm. You go into the anger that's sort of unleashed during mm. this period. Mm -hmm. And I loved this quote um, from Valerio, uh, one of the most predictable, predictable outcomes of female to male transition is an increase in intolerance for, ba for bad behavior from others. Yeah. And that that is akin to that process of you of losing estrogen. Yeah, right, right. I mean, I, and yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's something to that, you know, I think some of the, the sort of veil of domesticity, like sort of, like, you're not going to be like, it's fine, whatever. Okay, I'll clean up. You know, you have less of that kind of energy, thank God. And you have more of like, you clean, you do the kitty litter. You know, I did it the last 20 times. You know what I mean? Like, you have more of that, like, actual you know, like boundaries, making better boundaries for yourself, actually. I mean, it's sad that it's been labeled as bitchy. That's the thing that's really hard for me. Like it's, you know, the like menopausal women are bitchy or they're impossible to live with. It's really not that. It's just that they're gonna, they're finally able to stick up for themselves a little bit, you know, you know, protect their own selves a little bit better. It's not bitchiness, you know? So that's really hard for me. And that did sort of come with, for me with, I did find, I found myself, feeling less strictly sort of, you know, you know, conventionally female, you know, I just, I had less interest in sort of performing my gender, less interest in, um, just a lot less interest in like, I mean, I don't even know what gender is anymore, but like, but like, <laughs> but like, I just felt less invested in, you know, just like being out there for other people. I, I more was like, well, let's just see who I am and let's just, you know, go deeper. You know, I was going out in the wild, with the whales and I was all, you know, also going, you know, sort of into the wild, you know, deeper into myself as well, you know? Um, and I did feel myself get more angry. And I have to say of all the women that I interviewed, I interviewed about a hundred women, you know, very diverse group. Almost all of them said that they felt more angry. Hmm. Almost all of them they, they, in different ways, like different levels, actually some so angry that they were like, they were, you know, they left their long-term relationships. Some like, just like things got to change or I'm, I can't do that or and not even with partners with you know greater families sometimes too like I can't I, I'm not gonna you know like I can remember a woman of six said I pick up my dad two times a week to go to his doctors my four brothers never do it you know I mean you know, just some like rearranging of some of the family tasks a little bit mm -hmm. um and yeah I saw I, I I heard a lot of that and most of the women I think got comfortable with it rather than wanting to change it mm -hmm. you know what well, you rather like one of the, the like rather wanting to get unangry they actually wanted to not remain angry but you know make their life so they would be less angry that's the point right mm -hmm. yeah in, in the whole notion of of renovating the whole arena in, mm. in other words 
men and women and developing some sort of social, you know, understanding mm. of postmenopausal women. Mm. Um, how, what has your male readership been? Mm. Or, mm. Like? I mean, it's been pretty, pretty good. I mean, I did a lot of radio shows and I did a lot of um, like uh, local, like, you know, the local like NPR shows. And there would always be, it was always very lively. Sometimes they would have like a very strict kind of hormones doctor there and that would never go that great. But like, but, but they usually had a doctor that was more, more open to think, you know, more open to lots of things. And sometimes they had like a sort of midwifey you know, kind of lady, which was great. But, um, but there would always be one man that would call in like near the end. And I would think, oh no, you know, here we go. We're going to have to hear something. And the man always, this was like maybe over, 15 different times said like my wife's you know is in this or is about to go through it how can i help her through this passage mm -hmm. every every one of them you know mm -hmm. and that really made me really feel like they don't have the information i i mean like i mean if the women don't have the information and they're and it's too weird to share it they really don't have the information you know and so it really seemed they really seemed sweet to me and kind of kind of wanting like wanting to figure out how they could help and what could, you know, what they could do, you know? I mean, for the men that I interviewed for my book, I'd say it was about half and half. About half of them were very like irritated and like some of them would even say to me, like, I want the woman she was before back. And I felt like I would never say to him, but I felt like that ship has sailed. <laughs> you, know what I mean? like, you should really learn, learn to live the amazing woman you have in front of you now. That's the project, you know? Uh, but then others of them were cool. Otherwise, actually, others of them were very much like, I mean, they might be surprised by some of the, the changes in their sex life and stuff, but they also were kind of positive about it. The closeness, I think, the, like the men that were able to embrace it, they, there was a sense that there was a, a, like a great, a great, a, a greater, like, intimacy, a greater intimacy because it's a, to show vulnerability. You know, you have to sh sort of show your vulnerability when you're going through menopause, you know. Um, so that, um, so that was good. I always meant to write something for men about it, but I just never got around to it. Um, but I don't, it wasn't even sure how I would do that or what I would do, but, um, but somebody should, <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Completely. Yeah. Now the first whale that you became interested in, or the, the first entrance into this, uh -huh. when you read about killer, killer whales, mm -hmm. um, there was an opening there in that in that they often became the pod leader. Right, exactly. Can you talk a little bit about Sure, that? sure, sure. And then maybe I can read about seeing Granny too, should yeah, I? Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. So let me talk. I'll talk for about five minutes and then I'll go. Um, okay, so when when killer whales some go through menopause around 45 or 50, they then become the leaders of their pods. They go into leadership positions. Um, and they know where the salmon is in, in time of scarcity. They, these you know, whales are unbelievably smart. They have like, you know, they have spindle cells. So they have, you know, they have empathy and emotion like us. Some of their um, brains are about three times as big as, as big as ours. They're just incredible creatures. But I mean, I mean, some people say they have all the area of the ocean. So the hundreds of miles, like, like map, like in their head all the time. Um, so when they go through this, this transition, they become the leaders, and uh, they move into this some leadership position. And 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 the um, scientists who studied, you know, from the little article I saw in the Times, from watching them, you know, over years, like twenty years, they saw that the, you know, the fifty and sixty and seventy and eighty year old uh, um, females were always in the front, you know. So uh, they figured out that maybe this is why menopause was selection selected in the Darwinian sense, because there's a lot of confusion about that. Nobody understands why, why menopause would be selected when most creatures breed to the end. And if this idea of fitness, um, which means having as many children as possible, is the point of life, why would we stop breeding, you know, at, at midlife or, or, you know, as for 60% life. Um, so this is the first idea that is like so great it's based on the grandmother's hypothesis but it's a little different than that too um is that at around these whales get so important to the group like for their knowledge that they you know start to lo lose the 
you lose the ability to menstruate and give birth because they were they were needed for other things, right? And so then there had to be two groups of women, one to do the incredibly important work of motherhood. I mean, I did that, it's unbelievably hard, it's so, so crucial. But then this other group to do this other incredibly important work, and I would argue equally important in some ways, you know, of leadership and 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 helping the group sort of, you know, you know, socially, you know, kind of bind together and partnerships and stuff. So in that same article, they speculate that when we were hunters and gatherers in our earlier forms, this may be why menopause was chosen for us as well. You know, you know, at around 50, women got so valuable. You have to remember this is this was before technology, right? So you, you couldn't just look on the computer, oh, which plants are poison, right? You needed some old old lady to tell you that, you know? Actually, or what does the ocean look like before the tsunami comes, right? Like you, you needed somebody who had all that. Like, so at, at, I, I actually think that, that you still need somebody to have all that. But um, but so at around 50, we also as as women became so powerful that two groups of women were made, you know, so yeah, so created. So that to me is is such a thrilling idea. And 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 it, it kind of seems, it just really seems true to me. Like there's a lot of other theories of menopause as well. Um, but that one see it's just in my heart, I know it's very positive, but in my heart it also seems really true. It just seems like yeah, you you now have a new you have a new thing to do. You know, you may you may be still mothering a little. You may still have some domestic stuff, but you're you're moving into this new phase when you're going to have other interests and and other responsibilities, and sometimes to your family again, but also sometimes to the greater world and the greater culture as well. I mean, like a lot of the women that I like interviewed had felt a real push to you know sort of dilate you know, their activities and. And do some things that were for the community, for you know, for the groups that they were interested in, you know, to, to sort of like interact with the greater world as well. Um, so yeah, so that's how that happened. Do you want to read that passage? Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot, I forgot. Actually, I got so excited about like <laughs> all right. So I just want to read this little part about actually this is my favorite part of the book. So I'm just gonna read like just a page about seeing seeing Granny. So the whale that is the most like inspirational to me. She was 105 when she passed. So she's gone now. I think she's been gone for three years. Um, she's named J2. All the whales have numbers and letters. And she, you know her by her notch. Like each whale is recognizable by their dorsal fin has a little, each dorsal fin is slightly different, but hers has a big notch in it. Probably from a, like a run-in with a boat propeller. And she was really the only one that um, I, I had hopes of, there's, there's about 75 whales. I had hopes of of memorizing all the dorsals, but hers was the only one. So this is about, all right, so I'm, I've am i gone, I've flown from Brooklyn to Washington. I've I've gone the, you know, I've ridden the fan, as the van up the coast. I'm taking the ferry over. I've gotten into a sea kayak. I've gone out like 10 miles into the ocean, this long sea kayak. Okay, so, all right, so remember that Granny has a notch. So that's the one thing to remember here. So, all right, so, yeah, I go up with the, you know, I'm out with a group that has a guide too, and the guide is sitting in back of me. That's an important part too. After lunch, we load back into the kayaks. The wind is the wind is less severe now. The water placid, smooth. As we clear the bay mouth and move out into the Salish Sea, the guy with the humpback tat tattoo says he thinks he sees whales whales to the west. I see them, small black and white shapes, breaching and spy hopping. Matt has us raft up. I grip my neighbor's paddle. Will holds on to the bull kelp rooted on the sea floor so we don't drift. Matt says, if there was more time, he'd tuck us into a nearby cove. The whales are moving fast, making their serpentine way in and out of the water. Their dorsal fins are bigger than I imagined, towering over the sea. Massive heads push giant, giant pillows of rippled water in front of them. Each time they rise, breaking the surface, the sea streams off their backs like rainwater sheeting off a tilted roof. The theater lady is worried they are swimming directly at us. Could we capsize? Matt reminds us to hold each other's paddles tight. I feel the kayaks rise up a little in the water. As the whales swim closer, talking stops. The concentration is acute, singular. I feel my pulse speed up my heart shaking my rib cage. Two whales surface 10 feet in front of our kayak. Their eye patch is so white they glow and their dorsal fins stretching high in the air. Kawoof, 
their blowholes go off one after another. The kayaks jumble together on the confused sea. I am a small land creature floating on the edge of a vast ocean populated by giants. When I look down, I see several whales swimming beneath our boats, white tummies moving under translucent green water. Our kayak rises up and in front of me, only a few feet away, is a massive killer whale. Kawoof! I see a brown eye looking directly at me, the shining, numinous, expansive body. It's Granny, Matt says. I see the notch. So that was so exciting. <laughs> Actually, I later found out, and you feel really high after you see whales. It's, it's just well known that people do. Like, you know, our whole group, like in the van, was basically like, it's like we had to smoke a cigarette or something. It was just, we were just so incredibly like blown away by it. But I heard that the, the Rangers call it like an orcagasm. <laughs> <laughs> one, the one Ranger said to me, like, people don't get this way about foxes. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> yeah. Would you read another passage? Sure, sure. Okay, let's see. So um, let's see. Maybe I'll read, um, should I, I think I'll read this part, maybe like at the back. I'll read a little piece about, um, I'm gonna read a little piece about, you know, about the end, you know, a little piece from the end. Let's see. Menopause is situated at the, cr at the crossroads between the metaphysical and the biological. It's as much a spiritual challenge as it is a physical one. At this crossroad, I have felt haunted by my animistic past. We must acknowledge, Charles Darwin wrote in his 1871 book, The Descent of Man, that man with all his noble qualities still bears in his, his bodily frame the undesirable stamp of his lowly origins. Lowly or not, animals are the main way we know ourselves. The first symbols were animals. The first paintings were of animals. The first metaphors were animals. We judged our, our speed and our fierceness by them. The first religion, religions had animals at their center. When we speak of the human animals, spontaneous interchanges with the animal landscape, writes the philosopher David Abrams, we acknowledge a felt relationship to the mysterious that was active long before any formal or priestly religion. The animals opens before me a depth writes George Bataille, that attracts me and is familiar to me. In a sense, I know this depth. It is my own. It is also precisely that which is unfathomable to me. I see now that those moments I used to think of as transcendent in a religious sense, when the natural world and its creatures seem to glow with an inner light, are actually glimpses into my lost animal consciousness. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Thank you so much. The, the, the last question I wanted to ask you um, was, you know, I mean, in that passage, you quote from Bataille mm -hmm. and, um, and you quote from, you know, throughout the book, I mean, Colette, Clarice Lispector, mm -hmm. William James, Chris mm. Deva, you mm. sort of do this panoply of you bring in lot and you bring in television, you know, there's there's a lot that you draw on. And how did you go about, I guess, melding your own observations with your research with the work of others that's fed you through this period? <laughs> so to speak, right? in, in your, um, in your thinking about menopause? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, how I, I mean, I think I feel lucky that I found the form because I have a very discursive mind. I mean, you, you know, you've been my friend for a long time. And I mean, when people talk about Biden, like a, like a conversation starts, you know, starts at A and like ends at Z, I'm like more power to you, man, because like, that's, that's where I'm at. Like, my mind just is all over the place. I've had a lot of trouble, like keeping hold of linear things, I think. So it fits me, first of all, it fits the way my mind thinks. So that's really wonderful to find a form that kind of fits my own thought. And I think also all like bringing all these other things in there, it's also sort of like oh, me too, like, you know, a combination of, 
of everything. But the way I actually wrote the book is I started to read because I was like, okay, well, I don't know anything about the subject. And, you know, it's a big, I'm going to have to really learn. I'm going to have to do a lot of different things for this book. So what I would do for each chapter is I would sort of be like, I would read about between 20 and 30 books. So I'd spend a whole month just reading. I would get up at like eight o'clock in the morning and just read all day long. And then, and read at night too. Like it was, that was my time of reading. And then I would take notes and I would get about two or three big notebooks full of notes. And then I would think to myself, you know, what do I want to say about this as well, right? Like, so I've no, I actually now I know all of this. And then I would figure out, I would make notes on my own feelings then too, like my own memories and my own ideas. And then I would slowly make notes of my notes. And then I would make notes of my notes of my notes. And I would make, you know, like notes. Of my, and I would eventually get like a 20 or 30 page thing. Um, and I, it was really important for me for it to be about other things, but also to, to be about me, that I was the through line, that my story was the through line, that, uh, that my body was the through line in the way. So, I mean, so I worked hard on that. Like I worked hard on like trying to figure out where, where my story lied within, the, you know, within these other stories. So I have to say every time, every time I was like, this is never going to work. I have no, every single month every, and without, and I'm not lying every single month. I was like, this is never going to work. Why did I do this project? I don't have anything to say about this. You know, how am I going to do this? And then I would just go to my desk and it would, you know, I would just slowly work on one chunk at a time. And then I would say, oh, oh, this chunk kind of does fit with this other chunk, you know? And then I would just slowly build it, you know, but like it, it never, I never felt confident about it. I never felt like, I mean, I felt energy, but I didn't feel confidence. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But as the chapters kind of got up, I remember in the last six months before I had to I turn the book in, I was supposed to write one chapter. And then I sort of was like, I think I'm going to write this other chapter too. So then I sort of knew that I sort of had the, I had the tiger by the tail a little bit. So I, I got to a place where I'm like, okay, I can, I can bring this thing down for a landing, you know, it's like, but it was different than any book I've ever written, but I loved, I loved working it. I mean, I, I ran to my desk. I almost felt like the book was writing me. It just was a very, like a very rich, I mean, not all books like that and like are like that. And sometimes like books that like people are miserable writing are just like incredible, you know, masterpieces. So I don't believe that like, it has to be like this, but it's a very nice one that happens for a writer, you know? Like, so I, it was two years of really working really hard, you know, so that was fun. Yeah. Thank you guys. I'm Thank joining. You. Thank I'm, you so much. <laughs> no, this was really, has been really wonderful. And I'm joining you in part to encourage everybody to, um, as to put questions into that queue under the ask a question button if you have them um, and and we'll get to those. I think Darcy in reading those two passages that you chose you've given a sort of hint at, um, at the, the many dimensions of your writing in in this book and there are many others you know there are, there's a kind of medical history voice there's a really sort of badass political voice in it um there there are many different voices and um it's it's really marvelous so maybe i will just start us off start the q a off with a question of my own if you don't mind um and i i i want i pulled out an, a sentence that i loved um not sure from which part where you say an earlier fragmentation created by cycling and the male gaze is finally mending and I love that word mending in that sentence. Um, and it's a it's in a passage, I think, in the book um, that connects the, that experience to a differently developed aesthetic sensibility to to a sort of reflections on beauty and and laying down the burden of the struggle for uh, some notion of female beauty and that opening up um, a different a different relationship to the aesthetic to beauty oh. um and and i found that i found that really uh, uh rich and wondered if you yeah. wanted to say something more about it yeah no i i definitely felt that um yeah that i think the line is something like since i strive less to be beautiful myself i'm able you know i'm overcome by beauty more yeah overcome and i do i do find that to be really true i find that to be um it's interesting because it keeps going now and it's even getting more interesting now in a way because it's like it's almost like i feel i just feel like 
embedded in the world in a different way. I feel like I do feel for me, you know, I'm cycling and the male gaze was it was fragmenting, like it was hard, you know, and I do feel I feel more whole in a way. Like I feel more less just more, you know, whole and, and that wholeness seems to be able to like join with the like the greater earth better, you know. I mean, I think it's also about my interests. Like, I think in some ways, like earlier in my life, I was maybe more interested. I still love to go to parties, believe me. Like, but I was more interested a little bit in like sort of being out there. And now I am more interested in being, I think, like inside myself, but also like inside the natural world as well, like inside the world of animals. I'm very interested in like reading about animals and sort of filling the world up. I mean, now when I see a spider web, I know it's like, I know what kind of spider web it is. I, I, I know sort of maybe what kind of spider that is. And so I, I feel sort of, I feel like I'm in better communication. Like I'm a better earth citizen mm -hmm. since I don't have to worry about doing my hair all the friggin' time. You know what I mean? It's just like. Yeah. There seems to be, there seems to be though. I mean, part of, part of what, and I, I'll get to a question that's now in the queue, but the, part of what, um, what, what I kept tracing in the book mm -hmm. is that there seemed to be though a, a kind of dialectic between um, it's not that, you know, you were fragmented and now you're whole or, yeah, right, you right. know, but that there are these, these sort of dyads between feelings of alienation and, and being thrilled, uh, being disoriented and being, uh, very energized, but somehow the, the alienation and the disorientation are the pa are the ways towards what you're, you're now saying is a kind of wholeness, I think. Right. Another word you have is a different sense of authenticity. Right. But it's not that just that you you sort of you're released from this one paradigm oh, and you no, no, and you right. land in another one. It's right. that there is this work and right. that yeah. that relies on embracing the um, positioning yourself differently towards those experiences that can be alienate, alienating or disorienting and yeah, painful and hot right. and all. Right. right, right. I mean, I think that. that um, the the struggle um yeah the struggle is very important right and it continues to be important you sort of have to stay in the struggle right, right. and maybe the struggle it, it's not like it was good and now it was bad and now it's good or you know or like most people think it was good and now it's bad it's more it's more a mix up of all those things yeah, yeah. But I that's right what? Right. It's a different struggle. It's a different struggle. Yeah. 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 I think that's yeah. right. And I like the that you say, you know, because it's new, it's interesting. I think that's yeah, not, that's, that's, I that's, find a, that, that's a beautiful key to aging. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's very yeah. true. And that's the one thing. I mean, I can't say that I'm like, am I looking forward to it? I mean, I, I'm looking forward to change the change is interesting. I mean, for a person mm -hmm. and for a writer, you know, it's interesting. Like all the changes will be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even though there's struggles too. You know, like, right. Yeah, of course. Um, so Noreen here, um, and hello to, to Noreen, um, is asking another question about the about the form and is interested in the, the shortness of the paragraphs and mm -hmm. wondered sort of how you got to that um, arranged in the style of a commonplace book, um, whether that was present from the start or, mm -hmm. or was it a kind of whittling and condensation down uh, as you as you were revising? Um, I, I I got the form on the first chapter, and I I had I wrote the first chapter like a normal you know normal linear chapter with no breaks, and I tried to make everything. And I realized there were, there was something sort of missing from it, and I also couldn't fit the stranger things that I wanted to, you know, that I thought were so important to my particular book, you know. So I kept on reworking it. I probably worked. I can remember. I was in Paris when I was doing it and I probably reworked it like 20, I kept going to Kinko's because I didn't have my, my printer. Like I, I had to really work to, to, to make the form the first chapter. And then once I had that, then I was, I, I, I didn't know if I could do it, but I thought, okay, this is what the, you know, you know, the book will be in this form and that will allow me to include, I mean, so many things had to go. I mean, my, my aim was to have a book that was big, but really small. I mean, probably because those are my favorite kind of books myself, actually, but is to have, a, I mean, almost like a book of poetry, like a very big book, but then like small. So I worked hard um, toward that. And I, I do love that. I love when I'm reading now, I really love whether it's, you know, Sarah Manguso or, or Maggie Nelson. You know, I love that. I love the, the, the sort of, you know, the new essay. I love that. Yeah, those are definitely cousins um, for, for this book, I think, for sure. 
um, you guys, if you have other questions, queue them up. We have some a few more minutes. Um, I maybe I will follow up on what you just said about toying with the idea of maybe writing something uh, for men about menopause. I would say that you have written something for men <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, about menopause, yeah. but but I do wonder um, in your mind how that would be different. Um, yeah, I know. When you think about that, what uh, what would well, it be that this is not? I guess in my mind, it would have a format of like, like your brother confides in you that his wife is going through this and you go and meet him for a drink and talk to him about it. You know what I mean? It would have like an intimacy of its own. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I don't really know what it's like to be a man exactly. So I don't really, I wouldn't really know what to tell him about um, some parts of it, but I don't know. I just think sometimes it's good to lay things out. I hate to say this, but like really simply <laughs> like, like, for men. No, but like, but, but also when it comes to the thing. Yeah. I mean, for, you know, also when it's about the female body, just sort of lay it out, you know, like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I worry that they're getting, I mean, you know, I, I, I think about when my daughter, when she was 12 or 13 and all the struggles with, you know, the crazy things that the boys would say about the girls' bodies and stuff. I didn't know anything, you know? And I think about that sometimes in menopause too. Like even though there's maybe been a lifetime, I mean, if you're in a heterosexual relationship, you know, maybe there's a lifetime of, of you know, a cis relationship of, of, of knowing each other, but in some ways there's a, a private or self that hasn't been known, right? So how do you, how would I get that out there? I don't know. I think that is the thing that needs to be talked about though between couples. I mean, most of the communication has to happen between couples, you know? Mm -hmm. it's like, it's a time where like couples should really be communicating and, and, and not in a jokey, teasy way, like in a, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. in a really a caring, empathetic way, you know. You have a nice, a nice word for um, what is sort of necessary in, in couples in that time and which is un, unlearning, yeah. um, which is sort of a joint unlearning of, um, uh, of, of codes and practices right, and, exactly, and so yeah. on. And I actually wonder now that you're talking, I'm, I wonder um, whether there's any relationship between that and um, and your f sort of feeling, f your attraction to the to the wild. You're looking yeah. for you're looking for something in this book that you call wild. You yeah. Know? yeah um, wild. Obviously yeah. in the animals, but yeah. but. Um, uh whether the you know certainly the unlearning is very specific in your chapter about about sex during mm -hmm. you know during this phase but it seems like it's called for in a more general way and mm -hmm. um, yeah i think that's right actually i think that's this you know you sort of have to th throw off some of the things that you thought were whether it's this the typical fertile you know sort of sexual script in the bedroom or or, or whether it's what you even thought you'd like to do, you know what I mean? Like this, this the way you like to be in the world. I think I, yeah, I do think there's a sense of unlearning. I mean, that that is my my favorite spiritual concept is unlearning, mm -hmm. and like unknowing and sort of the way that you can the only way to really you can't really get anywhere, but the only way you can do anything is just to unlearn, <laughs> you know, yeah. or just to sort of sit in your, you you know, you know, sit in the mystery of it, you know, sort of like. Well, you write really well too about, and again, from an outside point of view, but you write about the aging male body too. Right, I do, and yeah. Maybe, maybe the idea is to treat the whole thing as a wilderness together. Right, I think that's right. Un right. Once you've unlearned, right. you sort of explore together. Exactly. I mean, the, 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 the man that I found that was the best he seemed to have completely embraced it. I mean, he had this wonderful quote that he said that sex has become more like play, that you don't you don't necessarily know where it's going to end. It, it, like it doesn't always end at the same place as it used to. You know, it's there's a, a, a feeling of freedom. And he also said that that doesn't really take away it doesn't take away urgency, but it it brings in it brings in, I guess, a sense of wildness maybe. I mean, that's the cool thing. I mean, he and one other man also mentioned that without the idea of the possibility of having children, they felt more freer, like in their physical life. And that's something that you really, you don't hear a lot of, I've never had, had never ever heard a man say that before, but that's interesting, right? And I, that makes sense too, in a way. It'd be nice if they could admit that a little more. 
you know, because that's a positive for us, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Totally. Yeah. But I, I love that, um, Darcy, the, the, the notion of unlearning as a spiritual practice. And I, I, I really felt in the description that you read of that encounter with J2, mm -hmm. um, what's so powerful there is there's, it's not a moment of recognition. Ooh, you yeah, know, exactly, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's a moment of very deep otherness and, right, totally, yeah. and, felt, and yeah. unknowing and not knowing yeah. and, um, and, and, and being in, in the presence of something that, um, that attracts you and you have some commonality that you've constructed in this book through this kind of postmenopausal right, phase. Right. But basically it exceeds you. And yeah, totally. I mean, I think it's not, I really didn't want it to be like, like a rich lady sentimentalist, you know, story about her, about her elephant. Cause like, you know, that really wasn't what it was. It was really mm -hmm. like, there was almost a coldness. It was kind of censorious actually. I mean, she looked mm -hmm. at us, like she looked at us for sure, but it was a more like a, get your shit together look you know what I mean? <laughs> it was like what you guys i mean think about it she's like you know they're they, they barely have enough salmon to eat they're like struggling and then here we are just like you know like eight humans in these boats just like you know staring goo goo eye and basically crying over seeing them you know and they, the look was just so amazing i mean her sense is her sense of leadership too you know what i mean like you really felt like you were in the presence like of a leader, you know, and that's not a thing that I've felt a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that was really fascinating too, to yeah. see that, like to feel that. Yeah. It was very fascinating. It was, and it was not, it wasn't at all. Um, there was like nothing sentimental about it. It was in some ways it was disconnected, but it was so much more powerful because of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I wonder whether maybe we should, um, we should end on that, on that <laughs> note from J2 uh, to us yeah. to, to get our shit together. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because we really have to. Uh, yeah. We really, really all have to. Uh, there's so much. There's so much in this book. I want to send you all to it. Um, if you don't have questions now, you sure as hell will when you when you read it. And um, with that, I think I'm just going to wish you all a, a good night. And I hope to see those of you who are in Princeton in the store. Um, if you are tuning in from elsewhere, and part of what's great about these events is that you can do that. Um, and go out and get uh, Darcy's book and get it from your local bookstore if you're not ordering it from uh, from Labyrinth. Support your local bookstore, please. Oh, please yeah. um, it's so great to be with you in this form for, for this little while, and I'm looking forward to a shared meal. Um, so. Good night to all of you and Lovely. thank you again. Thank, thank you so you. much. Good night. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.